The battle of Britain is about to begin. Welcome back to the Lead Pursuit Podcast. While many of our listeners are historically grounded grognards, grognards in rehab, really, the LPP team is not. Years ago, all of us invested in way too much dust 1947 models, terrain, airplanes, troops, and all those, they never saw the table. Well, except, I guess, Matt. Matt's actually played a little bit. Uh, But anyway, yeah, we admit it. We're weird war fanatics. We think that's pretty cool. That's why when Ken threw all of that, quote, unbelievable Wonder Waffa junk out of the ready room, we're more than happy to take the discussion over to a new home, the alternative Blood Red Skies ready room. Tonight, I'm joined by the man who is the unrepentant primary shit poster of the alternative ready room, Brett, or as we call him here, the field marshal. Brett, how you doing? TO-335 is World War II's best fighter. We all know this. I know. How many of you asked to be printed up uh, to play in this game? Uh, All of them. (laughs) <laughs> Every single one of them. Well, that's two, isn't it? Maybe three? No. Uh, well, you know, tonight we also are joined by yet another one of the a-holes of the team, Matt. Matt, your alternate timeline fantasy isn't safe for this podcast. That's really, really disturbing. Well, I don't know should if we be. should go there. But anyway, <laughs> to continue, Matt, it's good to have you on. How are you doing tonight? I'm good. I'm glad to be here. Your alternate World War II fantasy probably involves Matahari and Tokyo Rose. And yeah, well, we'll just leave it at that. Well, I, anyway. I was just a bunch of A4s, but. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no A4s in this timeline. All right. Uh, real quick before we dive into the K-47, let's talk about a couple events. This week, as we speak, uh, Origins is kicking off. Uh, a bunch of BRS games there. There's been some talk in the ready room and listing of all those different games. So if you're there, go play, play BRS, enjoy it, have a good time, and talk it up so that other people start another uh, addiction slash hobby, whatever you want to call it, uh, of Little World War II in Korea airplanes. Historic on the next one out of the gate, 17 to 21 July, uh, Brett and uh, sorry, not Brett, uh, Steve and I will be there. And so will Roger Garish. And we're going to be streaming on Twitch, playing Blood Red Skies, doing some Blood Red Skies Vietnam uh, and probably some Octung Panzer, it sounds like. So we'll be uh, hopefully uh, getting a wide variety of Warlord games on the stream there and watch us all make fools of ourselves. But have a good time. Uh Just thrown back onto the schedule, NashCon, 15 to 18 August, we'll be doing a Blood Red Skies tournament on Saturday. Just got confirmation of that. And on Friday night uh, or Friday afternoon, we will do Blood Red Skies, Wing Commander, Jets, so Vietnam, Indo-Pak, Taiwan Straits, all of those. So if you haven't uh, had a chance to play with the jet and missile rules, then come out to NashCon and at least I'll be there. Matt, hopefully you're going to be there for part of it. Yep, should be. Uh, and a bunch of other crazy freaks will be there for the tournament. All right. Uh, also sounds like uh, Fall In will be the next one, and that's 1 to 3 November. Uh, that will also be back in Lancaster again, so we'll talk about that uh, as we know more. But once again, we'll probably be streaming, playing Blood Red Skies, and maybe doing some other things there. If there are other events, once again, let us know. Send us that information. We'll send you some swag in return. Uh, and we're always happy to have more people out there playing Blood Red Skies, whether it's narrative, tournament, or Wonder Waffa fantasy stuff. We don't really care. As long as you're playing Blood Red Skies or aerial war games, that's what matters to us. All right. Any other events you guys know of or are planning of attending? Um, no, Brett, we don't care about the furry con down there in Jacksonville. We're, we're, we're not going to put you up for that. Any other events? All right. No other events? Cool. Let's move on to the main topic. So, Blood Red K-47. So, Conflict 47 is in the air, all the weird war, crazy stuff that that entails. Well, 
As Ken asked a few days ago in the alternative Blood Red Skies ready room, which it was pretty surprising to see him darken the door there, uh, quote, given there's a reasonable chance of a BRS K-47 on the horizon, should we start looking at suitable candidates? That's a really open-ended question uh, from the master of close-minded questions himself. Uh, but anyway, so we're going to talk about that a little tonight because I think there's some pitfalls that people may be falling into. Um, there's some things that are kind of sacred cows, I think, that some of the K-47 community might have uh, we want to talk about. Um, but we really want to kind of open it up to what at least we've heard that a lot of different people want because there's been a little bit of polling, a little bit of answers. Uh, and personally, I think a lot of those answers are super conventional, so they're super boring. Um, but, uh, but you know, we'll talk about that all here in a little bit. All right. Brett, you know absolutely nothing about the Conflict 47 lore. Matt, you know a little bit? I do, yeah. Okay. So I'm going to summarize it, and then Matt can correct me when I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the baseline theory. When the first atomic weapon goes off uh, in Alamogordo, it opens a rift, a rift to another dimensions, worlds, whatever, strange stuff. Messages start coming through the rift in broken, uh, readable, decipherable text, voice, etc. cetera. Uh, and they have elements of technology, elements of mystical things, elements of things that don't necessarily make sense. Uh, and the rift at source is a is itself is a huge power source. So there's an ability for uh, things to be powered by this energy. Now you know, think that would give an, a, a balance or a uh, you know successive weight against the allies. Well, regardless of the fact that they opened up a rift when they dropped the first atomic weapon, uh, allies being what allies do, they're dumb asses, and they drop an atomic bomb on Dresden. Uh, to get the Nazis out of the war early. Uh, so nice work, guys. You open up a rift in Nazi Germany. So now they have access to messages coming through the rift and rift technology and things like that. Uh, and there, from then on, all kinds of things get spread. Things to Russia, things to uh, the UK. Japan gets in there when you know the Germans decide to share some rift technology with them. But big picture, uh, it's... It's a little bit of otherworldly stuff that seems targeted towards the specific faction. So the things that the Rift supplies to the US is different than the things the Rift supplies to the Nazis uh, or to the Soviets. And, you know, all, all things have, have some commonality to them. There's some sci fi to them, but some of them are more uh, macabre, some of them are cult things like the, uh, like the Nazis have. So, there's the fluff. Matt, anything else you want to add to the fluff? Uh, I, I think you, you pretty much nailed it. Um, we'll probably get into the more specific uh, nation weapons uh, as, uh, as we go on. But um, I think the like interesting part of the, the, the lore that or fluff um, differentiates it from kind of other stuff is everything's real hard science based. It's not um, like mysticism or uh, uh, like occult stuff even though it kind of appears that way on the surface. Yeah. It, and we'll get to that a little bit because there's a weird fine line. It's very different than dust that was blat blatantly Lovecraftian and, yeah. and things like that. Yeah. But there's a cult like science in there. Um, and so it's, it's uh, a weird kind of soft science fiction, not necessarily that's not as hard science fiction as the other. Yeah. Um, I'd say that all the kind of, pseudo culty stuff uh, is is more mutation rather than um dark god or cthulhu or right. something like that right. or nameless right. ones that, that type of stuff even though they might look similar does the technology have some effect on like i don't know propulsion stuff as well as weapons i saw there was like crazy weapons and stuff well so this is part of the problem of the current lore uh the current lore kind of gets employed in one of two ways. Either you have a really conventional vehicle, like a Churchill tank or a Sherman tank that carries a super rift weapon, or you have something that uses rift technology like walkers as an ability to to be high tech and mobile and all these these anthropomorphic tank things, you know, uh, mechs for lack of a better term. But they all carry 
regular conventional weapons. Those all have machine guns. They have cannons. They don't carry any of the rift weapons. And in the current K-47 army list. Now, uh, what I will say is let's not assume that that's going to stay the same way. We don't know. Maybe they're when they redo K forty seven, they're going to figure out that they want, you know, rift technology vehicles to use rift weapons. Um, but generally, you don't see that. So, like you'll see uh, for the Germans, you'll have Panther tanks that have rail guns, uh, but your Walkers will carry eighty eights. I, I so think they're strange. Um, one of the larger, like really large Walkers. Uh, does have a rift, rift, wep, rift weapon, but if I remember the the cost, the points cost on it was enormous, and it was it was yeah. kind of the same. I mean, it was it was intended as a bolt on to bolt action, no pun intended. Um, so it kind of the same problem with larger vehicles and bolt action occurs with K forty seven, where the larger the weapon, the more powerful, the more points it's going to eat up, and it becomes way less um, cost effective. Right. Right. Well, the the other thing to think about is there's the way the Rift technology has been distributed. It seems like most everything is fairly large and clunky. Mm-hmm. Even when you have light power armor, for lack of a better term, like the Japanese power armor suits, their battle frames, or the German or the or the uh, uh, Soviet ones. Uh, at best, they're carrying automatic rifles. Mm-hmm. So, like the Russians, at best have a AK-47 strapped onto their arm. Uh, maybe some of them carry flamers. Uh, so it's it's kind of interesting that you're not getting um, crazy super high tech, but it's it's kind of compartmentalized between stuff that uses the rift uh, rift energy to be a unique unit, and then convent normal units that have a rift energy weapon. So, well, and, and uh, I think we're probably going to ma- be making this comparison all night uh, between um, dust and, and K-47. Um, just because they're, they're kind of in the same genre and two of the, I think there's, uh, I think West wind productions has another weird world war two line. I'm not even sure it's still in production anyways. Uh, but most of the dust walkers were walkers with it, you know, a, a, a standard Sherman cannon, a 75 millimeter or whatever. Um, they only, they were very few, uh, unique weapon systems that had both, um, you know, a unique propulsion system as well as a unique weapon system. Well, I think the the difference, at least as I remember in Dust and looking at the units, were that they they might have things that are out of time, I'll say, like, mm-hmm. like the Ontos, mm-hmm. where they have a walker that has six recoilless rifles. So that's a 1960s kind of thing. You're right. It's not a, it's not a super high tech thing, but it's, it's something that doesn't fit the time period. Um, and so there were, there were things like that, that I seem to remember, but you know, once again, who knows when, when Andy and his team, um, take over and start running with the K 47 lore, this could all be up for grabs. You know, we could, we could end up with, um, Japanese battle frames that carry, Tesla gun rifles, you know, who knows? Um, I, I do think that's what, uh, an interesting person note where the, um, di- I guess divergence from the normal timeline for K 47 is 1943 versus right. dust is much, much more, you know, later. So you have, um, like instances in, in K 47 where they're, uh, adding rift tech to like Panzer threes instead of you yeah. know, tigers and, um, you know, Stuart tanks instead of, uh, easy eight Shermans, that sort of thing. Yeah, it's, it is, it, it starts with a, a lower bar for the, the world war two technology, which is going to have some application for what do you see in the BRS world? Cause even though it's conflict 1947, what, what has happened in four years of evolution of technology that were things that are Wonder Waffa aircraft, are they normal now? Or did technology just totally bypass those technological dead ends? Um, so, you know, I, th- I think that'll be a question we have to talk about. But let's talk a little bit about the advanced weapons, um, because that'll play into what some of the thoughts are. U.S. and U.K., right now they have Tesla cannons, big, you know, obviously energy cannons that glow in the dark uh, that are hard to hide. Uh, the Nazis, they have rail guns. Um, they also have the Schwerenfeld projector. Um, which I'm is a grad field makes things re- really heavy. Well, that was my uh, uh, mangled attempt. 
yeah, I was my mother's maiden Alan. name was Birkenholz. That doesn't mean I necessarily <laughs> know how to speak German. Uh, but uh, it's a grav gun, so it's going to make things heavier. That could actually be kind of interesting in a aerial uh, kind of environment. What would be the impact of those either as flak cannons or as uh, an aircraft weapon? Uh, the Soviets have the Zvok- <laughs> I can't pronounce this one. Zv- Zuvkovki, something like that, uh, projector. Uh, and it's a big sonic gun. So it's a totally different. Uh, Rift technology, um, but does uh, does a different style of damage. Um, but as Matt, you've alluded to the the these weapons all have huge power sources. I mean, when you look at them on tanks, they're either like towing a battery pack behind them or have giant battery packs bolted onto them, like the T thirty four. So, w- would these unique weapons even make it to aircraft? I I personally think the advantage for the rift weapon is uh, or the rift rift technology is really in propulsion systems that allows the walkers the i mean the u.s has jetpack troops um i think the the brits have night vision troops along with light i think they're telsa cannons or maybe the, the their what was their the initial prototype for that bullpup for their l85 i think right yeah they've got l85s or you know a prototype or world war ii l85 um so i think that's where uh, the the key is is in the propulsion systems we might see like VTOL aircraft um well somebody let's go back to does that mean no no cool rift weapons no tesla cannons on you know p38s maybe, maybe light no, ones uh the i think because, the, because remember dust had that dust had uh like the pelican mm-hmm. there in the the later evolution not in the first series of, of pelicans that were released but later on they had when they had phaser cannons or phaser guns whatever they're called yeah they're um, underslung right yeah underslung yeah. so you know it's kind of like um if you look at any one of the even stuka bolt-on mods where you're putting gun packs on them could there be an equivalent to gun packs as a card that might be at least for the u.s some kind of light tesla weapon maybe limited shots um who knows i, I see Maybe a B twenty five, something that size. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, that's the one I that that was what first came to my mind was that you replace the seventy five with a Tesla cannon, um, and it makes a pretty cool air to ground uh, kind of weapon. Well, you then, know, and the other thing, talking about the Germans, uh, you know, rail guns, you could use that in something the size of a Grief very easily uh, could carry uh, could carry a rail gun in it uh, or the Grav projectors. I mean, you think about the night fighters out there with their upward firing cannons the uh you know you you could replace that kind of thing with a couple shot grab field throw that into the middle of a bomber formation you don't have to shoot anyone down you just make them really heavy and they fall out of the sky so there's there's all kinds of kind of options there i think um but i, I think you're right it's going to be larger aircraft you're not going to put it on a, a buffalo you're not going to have a buffalo with tesla cannons yeah, the um uk's got the oh gosh it's the churchill meteor that's got rift enabled rockets on it, just like a Cali- uh, Cali- or yeah, Cali- yeah, yeah, um, a Calliope. Sorry. Yeah, there is Calliope. <laughs> oh, man, uh, I would not like that. Would be kind of cool to mount that on. Um, I mean, it could go either way, uh, German or, or U.S., U.K., or, or even Soviet, where it becomes an area effect weapon for, like, say, uh, German fighters attacking U.S. bomber formations. Right, and, and that's certainly something different for BRS. We don't have area weapons because. You know, why would you? But that would be something interesting um, th- that would change the di- dynamic of the game a little bit. Yeah. Like some kind of template weapon? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Laying yeah. a template yeah, on basically. the table? Yep. Something like that with, with these masses of rockets being shot with crazy, weird, extra energy. Which is yeah, bro, of- what kind of things? I know you ha- you're not necessarily a K-47 guy, but what kind of uh, specific weapons would you – want to see that might be weird war or oh, it's just advanced kind of thinking about that idea with templates. I mean, imagine you're on a regular blood red skies table, right? And you have a weapon that lets you put a pie plate on the table. Maybe it's, I don't know, would that be like about the size of a saucer? Right. So nothing that's, uh, you know, going to cover a whole lot, but maybe your roll to hit now affects, you know, two or three aircraft that they're real close together. That's yeah. kind of interesting. Yeah. That does change the dynamic, a little bit of formations and stuff like that. Uh, and, you know, one of the things I've always kind of thought about, 
uh, not looking at the K-47 kind of specific weapons, but how much they started to field you know, wire guided missiles, remote TV guided missiles, all these kind of things. Cause you see, um, I think it's, uh, it's for the Nazis. They have a anti-aircraft rocket. That's kind of a, a barrage, uh, anti-aircraft rocket. So there's, there's things that are future technology that we were kind of getting towards in the fifties and sixties, but have been pulled in forward into K-47. So you think about like the German, you know, remote control bombs and things like that could, could you field more, in a sense, drone aircraft, uh, things where you you might have um, generic pilot skill three or whatever, but but there's some advantage to them being remotely piloted. Who knows? Fewer points. Don't know. Okay, well, let's talk about some of the specific aircraft. Uh, obviously, they're going to be more advanced. Uh, they're going to have something that's going to be different than their 1947 equivalent. Um, but, you know... Brett, what are you what are you thinking? Do you are you thinking mostly early jets? Or are you thinking of some more of the quote impossible aircraft, the the paper aircraft? What what kind of do you think should be in K forty seven? Kind of a little of both. I mean, I, I, you, you know, keep it in mind. I don't know the lore K forty seven, but when we were first talking about weird war stuff, the first place my mind went to was some of the hypothetical early jet stuff that they had. Uh, of course, yeah. the you know, like the flying wing stuff, it's kind of, you know, that's sort of like uh, emblematic, I guess. Everybody recognizes that. Yeah. I, yeah. I think things, you know, like the Horton wing and, and stuff like that, uh, or the U.S. side, you know, um, the uh, the flying wing bombers. There's a lot of cool things there that you could do. Uh, I go back to the lore and kind of, at least for now, how how K-47 does it, it um, like the walkers are... Walkers and battle armors kind of push the envelope. They they allow you to have the benefits of other kinds of vehicles or other kinds of infantry uh, without the same restrictions. So like a walker is like a wheeled vehicle, but it doesn't have the same terrain restrictions as a wheeled vehicle does. There's a little bit of the movement distance, but it mostly it moves fast like a wheeled vehicle. Um, but as we talked about earlier, it, at least in the current K-47, they all carry conventional weapons or and some of them are super – Milk toast, I guess, is the word. Like the Japanese walker looks really cool. I think it's one of the coolest looking walkers in the game. And it carries, I think, two machine guns. Mm-hmm. I'm like, ooh, awesome. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the Shiha tank has more armament than it does. Even in uh, one of the American walkers, I, I think it's a grizzly, but don't quote me on that. It, it's got uh, two quad 50s. I mean, that's two, ha- two uh, half tracks. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, I mean, it's so, probably so I think mobile a, and concentrated, a, certainly. I, I think you hit on it that some of this is a little bit of um, bolt actionism, that that within the rules, limitations of the rules, when you want to create something that's unique, you say, okay, what I'm doing is I'm not creating a game-breaking mech here, but I'm creating a vehicle that moves faster than the half-track, has less restrictions, but I can't put a whole lot of weaponry on it because then it's just going to break the game, you know, or it's going to be too expensive. So I, my assumption from the previous versions has been that um, that there's there's a lot of balance in why the vehicles are that way, um, because otherwise you just wouldn't – if it had twin Tesla cannons and was walking around like a Warhammer from, uh, from Battle, you know, Battletech, uh, it would be 700 points. Uh, so I, I think we're going to see that a little bit with the airplanes that they're going to push the envelope. So they're going to move faster, be more agile, um, maybe have higher firepower or some other modification of the blood red skies rules. Uh, but, but they're, they're not probably not going to be game breaking, uh, against the other aircraft. Cause then what's the fun? If, if one super aircraft shoots down six regular aircraft, you're going to really have to point value it up there. And so now, what do you can do? Fly one of them in a in a BRS game? You know? So, so do you, it, this kind of leads to the question: How do you differentiate them from either regular BRS or, for example, MIG Alley, where you know Jet One and Two come into play? Because um, you don't necessarily. I, I mean, it, I think that's the toughest part because. <sighs> okay, so I'm going to get super technical here. Um, some of the coolest German and Soviet designs 
and even U.S. designs, are technological dead ends because of the engine technology used in them. Um, and that by the time people had fooled with the designs, they realized that that style of, of jet engine was just, you know, no one wanted to use a, you know, an, you know cannular system, you know, and, and things like that. So I, I think there's got to be a balance um, because if you – if you want them to play like jets, like, you know, jet one, jet two, things like that, you get in this weird uh, comparison with real technology that came later. So are we going to say that the, like the Yak 15's engine is, is going to be as efficient as a MiG-15 engine? Are they both Neen engines that are, that are um, from the same uh, generation? Cause they're really not uh, when you look at, at how they're, uh, how it's planned. Um yeah, so I, I think that's a, a tough rules piece because, in a sense, you almost have to create a different technology branch for all this weird war stuff. If you're if you're flying pulse jet engines and all this other crazy, goofy uh, technology, that doesn't apply to jet two because inherently it should be better than a jet two turbojet, I would think. I mean, it's I mean, it's an also impo- entirely possible. Um- K forty seven BRS could exist in a vacuum, right? Right. Uh, where much like you might be able World to bring- War One BRS, where where yeah. it, you should not try to bring it and cross it with other things, um, because then it could use the same lexicon of terms like Jet One, Jet Two, um, and the generations could mean something. Um, or the other option is when you when you say something is instead of saying it's Jet One. Maybe it's just called Pulse Jet or something, and so now Pulse Jet gives it um, an ability to defy all other jets, you know, and do some other cool thing. And honestly, it could open up an option for some really interesting equipment cards that do different things, right. rather than necessarily, um, you know, relying on the stats of the aircraft. Yeah, I, and I think the the toughest part with equipment cards is point values for equipment cards, the way it's designed in the game. But if you don't worry about a point value and you just worry about it being thematic, then it's not a big deal. Then then you can put some really cool abilities in there that you may or may not be able to balance out. And, and that kind of leads into my, I honestly just the, as you said, the kind of theme of K47 is new technology bolted on to existed, existing designs or new designs that look very much like or existing like the, the turret um, for, I think all the German and the, the U S tanks, uh, K 47 tanks with the rip technology are all borrowed from Sherman's pan, uh, pan, right. Panthers, Panthers and tigers. Um, so I, I'm specifically thinking that we're probably going to see some new engines or maybe some of like weapons since we're talking bolted onto existing designs. Well, but, but, but let's think about this. So you, you do run into a problem, and I'm not saying they're necessarily going to go the way Dust 1947 did with crazy aliens and stuff popping out of the skies. But when all of a sudden you're flying a, a literally a flying saucer and you try to put that into blood red skies, that's that thing is both great climb, great dive, tight turn, and jet 27. Right. Well, I, I was thinking more like um, someone posted on Buffalo Wednesday – it was like a, a super enhanced Buffalo stuff like that, right. where it's got extra armor uh, because it's got a better engine that's augmented by uh, the um, rift technology. So it might have, you know, some, some glowy parts up north you know, towards the engine uh, and, and, you know, a well, bunch of extra armor, maybe a longer wingspan. And I'll be honest, I think that is much more useful for blood red skies than going to crazy high tech stuff. Saying that the rift now allows us to fly, you know, pulse jets, scram jets, all these other things. Um, I, I think, I think that that if you if you do that, if you just up gun and up armor and up perform aircraft because of rift technology, then it gets fun because you're still playing a constrained type of aircraft. But now think about if you're flying, you know, mosquitoes that you know have rift technology. So all of a sudden, you know, air pressure problems with, you know, dives and things like that don't apply. P-38, same kind of thing. You know, what if they have rift-powered 
you know, gravity generators, uh, you know, that allow them to pull out of the dive. So there's, there's all kinds of things that I think give you recognizable aircraft, but with cool abilities. What's the, uh, German aircraft that had, it's a, um, it's got an engine on one side, the cockpit on the other. It's super goofy looking. Yes. I know. Which time I, I, I assume remember. Brett would know. Brett probably knows. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know what you're talking about. I don't know. That I, I think it was a creature. reconnaissance aircraft, but it would be neat to yes. see. Yeah. Uh, the Uhu or something. Uhu, yeah, Owl. exactly. I no, no, no. That was the, the, the Uhu's the night fighter. It's, it's, um, yeah, it's not, um, I've got this word, uh, symmetrical. It's got, uh, engine, on one side, then the cockpit is on another a cross of wings. So it looks like a P-38 that somebody chopped off one of the booms on and stuck the cockpit on the right or left boom. I, I don't know what it's called. Anyways, it would be cool to see something like that where the you know prop engine has been replaced by uh, it, you know the, a rift technology thing. Like some of the, so the, the otter. Yeah, the Uhu is twi- is a twin boom one. That's Uhu. not the one you're thinking of, no. but it's the that's the Fock Wolf one. Yes, um, yes. Yeah, I, I, I. Sorry, everyone. I can't remember the name of every German aircraft. <laughs> I don't know. I've, I've got to. I have to look it up. I figure which one it is. It's got the the uh, boom on one side. Yeah. Let's see here. And as far as I know, I don't think uh, there is a one. There we go. Scalar. The BV one forty one. There we go. That had the the body on one side and then the solid uh, frame with the empennage and everything that had the propeller on the front. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, BV one forty one B. But it, it'd be cool. Asymmetrical to see. gondola designs like that where like as you said they were maybe um dead ends or you know one trick ponies i think that was a reconnaissance aircraft um come out because all of a sudden the rip technology allows for you know lighter airframes or better engines or stuff like that where suddenly right. maybe um uh like the oh gosh what was the howard hughes the, the chain lightning becomes viable yeah. um right or the the boom bat becomes something that that we see with, you know, certainly modifications and stuff that make it look a little bit more advanced. The ass ender. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you could have those airplanes too. <laughs> you know, I, I think while, while I like the idea of the technology modifying uh, known aircraft and stuff, um, I, I do want to at least think about what are the possibilities of, dark tech. So I know Matt, your position is it's not arcane. Uh, I disagree. I think it's, it's super occult stuff that's in there. Yes. It's called DNA splicing. Um, but it's people dabbling in things they shouldn't be dabbling in. So the creation of flying crazy, you know, alligator toothed guys and, uh, you know, bear troopers, the Siberian horrors. I honestly think you just want to see a bear flying a, a yak. I do. I do. Pure and simple. <laughs> That's all I want. Um, but I, I think there's an element here that that doesn't necessarily exist in the current uh, K-47, but there's, there's a fine line to go between dust that was full on horror, Lovecraftian horror, um, and K-47 that goes in those directions, but it's got a technological explanation. But I mean, there's fucking zombies. How technological is zombies? I mean, it, it's pretty much fucking horror, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that yeah. would actually or, create or an interesting dudes that walk through so walls, the ghost walkers. If, you if know. I were well, so that, that there's two things to talk about right there is, um, as I recall, the, the they zomb- get stuck in walls if they fail their their terrain check. <laughs> <laughs> the the zombies are somewhat sentient, like they can wield weapons and everything like that. That that creates kind right. of an interesting. Like, what if you put um a bunch of zombies in ME one hundred nine? Yeah, zombie pilot well you were talking about drones what if you had yeah. like zombie drones that are you know exactly. piloted drones but they you know they don't get any traits or anything yeah. it, just, it's like the piloted version of the v1 bomb it'd be a v1 with a zombie in it you know and, and then now with, it can dodge and you know do things while trying to be shot down by the spitfire with the um the the ghost troops i i think there's i again i may be wrong here just that it's been a little bit since i've read it but they have some level of like invisibility in, in yep. coupled with the, the ability, I don't know how you would use, um, like the ability to to go through something in BRS because, like, generally collisions aren't um, 
unless they're declared. Right. Art, I, I was I, I was not necessarily thinking of that as a technology to put in there, but those yeah. kind of things that blurred the um, the technological with the arcane or mystical. I, um, I, I think so, there's a lot of potential. Can we get some werewolf pilots? It's yeah. always on. Yes. Advanced tech. Yeah. Or, I mean, uh, yeah. aggressive, aggressive tech is always on. Yeah. <laughs> They can't turn towards the furthest enemy. Not possible. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I, and I think that's that's a good point is because some of this, if it's even explained as just um, gene spliced stuff, doesn't really do much for you. My thought is I want fucking dragons. I, I want dragons with with like rail guns and shit and zombies flying them and freaking lasers on jumping their off of them. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So pretty much, uh, you know the uh, uh the scene of the b25 and the dragon and the dog fight that's that's what i want from sucker punch so ken that just turned off the podcast <laughs> yeah exactly ken it's like <laughs> screw these guys again they've lost their mind yeah no i um it goes down the whole question of what what is weird war and so much of people taking it for the nazi side has been going full throttle into the occult um that if we're already doing stuff out of viking lore fuck it let's bring up freaking sea serpents while we're at it to take out the convoys who knows uh but I, th- I think there's some other you know strange stuff we can do there all right so let's let's go back in and say you know uh we've talked a little bit about the the what if of what you know if andy makes k-47 brs look like you know the k-47 storyline you know conventional aircraft carrying unique weapons unique aircraft fairly conventional weapons um but you know really I have to get into what you all want to see. I mean, Brett, you obviously love uh, a lot of these Wonder Waffa aircraft that are just absolutely impractical. Is that kind of where your heart is set for K-47's uh, BRS? Yeah, I think just visually, I think that's what you know, the rule of cool definitely applies for me. I mean, I mentioned the Horton 229, but there's some others out there that I think are super cool. That I think would just look neat and, you know, whatever. BV. P two twelve comes to mind. Yep. The uh, I laugh. You put the the Henkel P one ten seventy eight in there. That's there's there's some just really cool looking airplanes. Yeah, um, that B model with the two uh, the two canopy like things yeah. or not canopies, but uh, I don't I don't know what the term is. Like two little fuselage, uh, con- two gondolas. Yeah, I think that's yeah. what they say. Uh, and then check this one out. I, I've seen this one. I've posted pictures of it. There's actually a video, the glider version of this in flight. It's a black and white video. The uh, the Lippish P13A. Yeah, so there's I'm having a, to go look a, that up because I don't even know what that it is. It is crazy. It, it's a, a oh yeah a, okay now I know yeah it's that little t- delta wing kind of triangle. Oh that thing. Can, it, yeah, it looks so alien, and it they ha- it does. They were contemplating what was a, a coal fuel powered version of it as an interceptor that's Just, wild so that's the kind yeah, of thing no, maybe th- some rift yeah. technology could make work right yeah and i think that if if you say we're going to use the lore of the rift tech to make all the paper project aircraft flyable and to make whether it's a problem they had with fuel a problem they had with aerodynamics problem they had with flight controls all of those things can be solved ominous dominus by rift technology um, i think that's fairly straightforward and i think uh you don't have to put crazy high tech weapons on them just to make it fun because they're going to maneuver differently. Um, they're going to look different. You know, is there a stat problem? Sure. Cause at some point everyone's going to be moving, you know, speed at 12, you know, 14, things like that. Uh, but that's the same as any other, any other jet game. So what do you think about this? Just like, you know, the factions sort of have their flavors. It seems to me the Luftwaffe, their thing is all interceptors, right? Right. Maybe, you know, maybe there's some room for having these you know, high tech things, but you could still stay in that sort of, I don't know if constraints are the right word, but where, you know, uh, maybe the American stuff is more long range uh, kind yeah. of stuff, whereas the German stuff is more like super fast, short range interceptor. But when they get there, they have a whole lot of killing power, but they're just, they don't, don't have a lot of staying power. I mean, I don't know. Right. Like, is there something like some kind of thought like that you could apply to each faction to give them sort of a flavor besides just their look, right? I, I, th- I think you could. I think the tough part is how do you shoehorn that into the current BRS rules? Um, because everything kind of happens in a vacuum. And we've had this argument for three years of who cares 
if you if you're a long range interceptor why does that give you deep pockets um because is it helping you get shot at uh it was like some of the discussion about twin engine aircraft that when we put them down as single engine equivalents did we make them deep pockets yes no whatever um i i think you could get into one of those because that's kind of how the p51 has been statted is that's got deep pockets because it has such a long range um Maybe they're just tougher, more resilient, I guess. Yeah. Well, would, would American Something jets like be robust, deep pockets? You know, <laughs> is that what the American ones would be in the, you know, uh, Nazi ones would be great climb and vulnerable. I don't know. <laughs> so, I, yeah, I think I think there's um, an ability to to still make the different factions feel different. And I think you'd want that, you know, to, to show the difference of the technology. Matt, what are your thoughts? What I, kind of things were you really, really looking for? I think I hit on a lot of already, but I, I would – stuff I'd like to see is advancement of aircraft that just, you know, didn't make it. They were phased out early in the war. But, it, you know, after uh, 1943, the technology was there to suddenly give them a better engine, a, you know, more armor, and create just kind of like weird, more – I don't want to say futuristic because we're, we're talking, you know, still talking 44, 45, 46, 47, but um, versions of aircraft that are recognizable. So, you know, Typhoon or, or Buffalo or uh, Corsair or something like that. But there's something remarkably different about it that, that makes it, you know, cool. Like, um, you know, arming ghost buffalo. buffaloes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> or, or, you know, like in the, the case of the Italians where in the K47 war, you've got the, the Cobol, the allied Cobol belligerents and then the, um, Nazi allied, uh, I think Republicans, right. ANR, um, where they're, uh, you know, you suddenly see the Fiat's that don't have poor quality. They've got better engines. You might see like rockets or something on like as a, um, on stuff. So I kind of like the idea of keeping or uh, just advancing the existing aircraft to an nth degree um, where we're not necessarily, like we kind of touched on before, not necessarily seeing like getting to like MIG 15s or Sabres um, or, or that type of stuff, but we're seeing like jet, jet type engines or ripped engines added to, you know, P38s or stuff yeah. like that. Okay. Well, I'm going to be different than both of you all. I I want the far high end Wunderwaffe uh, kind of ones that are so outrageous that there's no way they were ever going to fly because technology was just not going to get there. Um, so uh, if you had something like you know the the two twenty nine flying wings, HO two twenty nines that are jets and have, you know, multiple turreted weapons, you know, things like that, uh, fly by wire, highly agile ones. Um, you know, some of the more esoteric jets that were different kinds of pulse jet engines, um, different kind of, of ramjet concepts uh that were supposed to be launched off of other airplanes. So like parasite fighters. So you would field one bomber and then have a bunch of little parasite fighters. Um, that was supposed to be super high speed. Uh, it was like those little those, goblins or something. Yeah, those goblin yeah jets. exactly. So, so if you think like even some of the German ones, if you if you like take a um, uh, what's uh, like a not yeah, I guess the Condor, take the Condor size airplane and then throw a bunch of fighters off of it. Um, so it's it's one of those things that you have a very short time span to do whatever you're going to do, but super light little small fighters. Um, I'd want to see that kind of stuff. Things that that really kind of push the edge of the envelope because if we have walkers that are pushing the edge of the envelope, if we have battle frames and, and powered armor and stuff like that, that's changing how the, the fight's happening at the infantry level, um, then I think we should have something really different for the aircraft and not just be, you know, a step up and okay, we're going to field things that are, that are jet 1.5s because so, they're not as good as a MiG-15, but they're better than a Maybe two sixty two. So that brings that actually the Walker discussion actually brings up something. Is it possible we see like a World War Two Macross or Robotech type transformers? Well, yeah, essentially. I mean, if the if the technology allows for walkers with like limited flight capability, 
I Why don't not a think walker that's... with more flight capability <laughs> and maybe it's only got like 250 cows on it or something like that. But all yeah, of a sudden, yeah. it can jump up and smash into a, a bomber formation. Uh, yeah, with a fist. maybe, but, but I, that, that I, would a, be... I have a funny feeling that's not anywhere in uh, in Andy's plans. Well, now it might be. Uh, now it might be exactly. He's gonna be like, I'm gonna do exactly that. Well, imagine I a want P- land air mechs. Uh, imagine a P fifty one that transforms into a mech. That would be really cool. I'd, I'd rather not. <laughs> Where are the propellers gonna go? Exactly. Uh, but anyway, to let me finish, uh, and I want the element of the occult. So I want some super high tech stuff that's just thoroughly implausible and i want some of the occult in an in an aviation side so whether it's like brett said you've got zombie fighters that are drones um or do you have dragons or do you have uh some kind of fanciful thing that is gene spliced it's it's not a real dragon but they have now taken bat and alligator dna across them and you have flying dudes with Tesla guns. Um, I, I just want something that's that's a little a little into the occult for the Nazi side, and then obviously the Japanese has got to be uh, like Gundam light. I guess is the best way to describe it. Uh, how a lot of their a lot of their lore and fluff is kind of gone. So um, I think those things should be in there. Uh, we'll see how that does pair with aviation stuff because some of those don't necessarily cross over. Um, but I think uh, that's at least what I would like to see. Like I said. Dragons, B twenty fives, chicks. Well, we're in there, and this is kind of difficult with the scale. But they do have, you know, rocket troops, and then the, the Nazis have those weird vampire bat guys that are clearly yep. like. Oh, and granted, I don't know how fast they can they can catch a B twenty nine or whatever, but like that creates an interesting, like dynamic where you have like boarding actions. Yeah, the beach, yeah exactly. <laughs> well, well, yeah. I mean, think about it. if you have a condor that flies along and kicks out 20 of those dudes, you know, um, are, are there some of these things that you're going to have to generalize and make a, an equipment card or whatever for it? But, you know, I, I think that kind of stuff would be cool. You know, that would be really it's, it's unique. Totally. That would be yeah, very maybe it's like kind of like a tail gun effect. But again, throwing out that um, the uh, area effect weapon, like the template or whatever. So anybody right in your now, rear arc and that yeah. they're getting vampire bats or clawing at their <laughs> aircraft. Right now I have the image of the Russian paratroopers on top of the aircraft, all of them holding on for dear life and then just pushing off. Yeah. That's pretty much what the bat people things would do. So, yeah, no, I, I think there's, there's something to be thought of there. I mean, it, it obviously isn't something you're going to come up with in, you know, 20 minutes on a podcast. Um, but you could uh, definitely explore some of the occult versus technology tension between allies and access there. Um, and that I think that'd be kind of cool. All right. Well, to wrap it up, we know nothing of what Andy and his team are going to do. So this has all been kind of a spitballing and, and guessing at things, uh, basically in an effort to cover a lot of the bases for people so that they knew both what K-47 lore was like uh, and what things might fit or might not. Um, but realistically, it's going to be a couple of years before we would see anything Blood Red Skies K-47. So I think what I'd encourage people to do is to definitely already take the aircraft that are out there, uh, play some cool scenarios with those, do some narrative kind of scenarios, um, you know, make up your own equipment cards, have fun with it, you know, try some, some things. And, uh, maybe by the time the whole chain and snowball kind of gets, gets picked up with, uh, uh, K 47, Andy will say, Hey, these are some really good community ideas and, and run with those. Anything else in closing from you two assholes? Uh, I think we need to get Steve on some of these design ideas. No, no, he needs to make the A4. No, 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 you're right, you're right. No, you're right, you're right. right, (laughs) All A4s Uh, all day, and then we'll do an F8 Crusader. (laughs) Focus, man, Uh, focus. You're right. (laughs) Brett, anything on your end? Uh, You know, I was thinking all about sort of those concept aircraft, but man, you know, maybe some real room to fit the – 335 in there somewhere. I think there's plenty of them. The 335 is the most conventional thing out there, you know, with these things that we've been listing. So 335 with dragon zombie wingman. I think it's great. It's a great idea. Cool. I like it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I like that. That's, uh, uh, that's perfect. Let's do that. <laughs> Let's do that. <laughs> Wait, we need a model for the 335 because plane printer hasn't done a 335. 
my God, man, somebody get on that guy. We need a DO-335. After the story. All right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> Fuck you and your fucking little storch. <laughs> Nobody wants that airplane. Actually, I, I do have to laugh because uh, the guys over at Iron Dice, Evan and those guys were like, yeah, we absolutely need one. I'm like, all of y'all shut up. I don't want anyone to suggest this airplane anymore. I want it to go away. Zip it. All right. Hey, thanks for uh, your time tonight, guys. Glad to talk about K-47 and some uh, Blood Red Skies possibilities there. Really look forward to seeing everybody at the next couple events at Historicon and at NashCon uh, and anywhere else we find ourselves doing a little Blood Red Skies gaming. But I'd like to remind you all that we cannot save you hundreds on your car insurance, but we can help you not become a grognard. <laughs>